welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us here this evening at the El Segundo Museum of Art. We're here to discuss Damsel in Distress. Did anyone bring a copy of their book? Or has anyone finished the book? Okay, okay, cool. So I'm going to ask a few questions. I truly, truly enjoyed this read. I'm going to ask a few questions. We're going to have a dialogue, but I want you all to think about what questions you might have, what ideas you might have for when we all have a conversation together. So my, my first question for you, what inspired you to write Damsel in Distressed? Um, I think it came from my reading a quote from a young lady who was an MBA um, graduate uh, student who said, I think women don't go into finance because um, every image, every book, every media is pushing women out of the field, pushing them to opt out of the field. And there's really nothing to pull them in. So I thought, I'm gonna write a book or I'm gonna set out to write a book for women to opt in. And the second uh, step was to, you know, as one does, check out the competition and mm -hmm. I start reading uh, books about finance, books about hedge funds, and I realize invariably it's written by a white male about a white male, how fantastic and sort of godlike he is. Um, it's usually dry as toast. <laughs> and when you finished, you're not sure if you read this book or that book, they sort of all mesh together. So the idea was to write something um, about the business that would appeal to practitioners, but also people who are outsiders, uh, women who are in a, a male-dominated field. It can be finance, it can be rocket science, it can be art, it can be the media industry, and who, uh, you know, it would be a, a light read, it's a short book, and it would be fun. It would be a light, amusing uh, little book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, well, I think that it's more than a little book. And it definitely is humorous. I appreciated your wit. I was telling you that there were some times when I laughed outside, like, quietly to myself, and my partner would hear me reading and have, like, a little giggle. I, I think what's so interesting about when, when you kind of, like, uh, saw what the competition was and what other books were, I agree that most books about finance are, are not as interesting as your book. But also, your book didn't feel condescending. It didn't feel like it was a lamentation about what it means to be a woman in the field. It just felt very, very candid, very transparent. What made you be so, um, so steadfast in that approach? It's not a, it, it's not a condemnation. It's not a uh, tell-all, you know, gossipy uh, sort of uh, 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 open kimono and, and reveal awful secrets about the finance industry because how would you inspire women to get into the field with that kind of book? Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's number one. Number two, it's hard enough to sell a book, let alone if you bash your former <laughs> colleagues <laughs> and the, the entire business, then you you basically shut yourself out of an entire market. Mm -hmm. So part of it was you got to be somewhat uh, business-minded. Uh, but the other uh, part is to be inspirational, it's hard to, be, uh, to write a diatribe. Um, so, and, and honestly, Autumn, I had a great career. It was fantastic, um, a, a fan fantastic adventure. It was truly great fun. So um, that's sort of what I wanted to write about, where there are tough days and tough people and, and tough situations, of course, and everybody has that. But overall, was it uh, you know, a, fun, uh, a fun ride? Was it lucrative? Is it worth it? I wanted to say yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you talked about how you, you wanted to be open about what it means to be in a male-dominated field. It could be finance, it could be the arts, it could be the sciences. I think that your work is extremely creative. I, I don't see a difference between the different types of creativity that people can express. You wrote in your book that you can't paint, you can't dance, you can't sing, although you said that you are a good whistler. I'm I an excellent that. whistler, <laughs> and I challenge anyone. <laughs> we'll save that for after the talk. 
<laughs> but in finance, you found a deeply creative outlet. When in your career did you know that you are creative? Uh, very late in the game, and usually people don't talk about finance as being a creative field, and I think that's one of the reasons that women are not attracted or they're not considered as, um, as competitive or skillful in the field, because usually the image is, frankly, that of, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street or, or, or any sort of math genius, deal maker uh, type archetype. Um, and, you know, later in my career, when I started really taking charge of my portfolio and um, thinking about my specialty was stressed and distressed companies, meaning companies that are either in bankruptcy or are really having trouble, either with their business or their capital structure. And their job is to find solutions. Um, and I always thought, well, this is just my job, but in, in really thinking about writing a book, thinking about the stories, um, I realized, well, this is actually a job that requires creativity, that requires imagination, uh, ingenuity, and all these qualities are not male-related. Uh, I think women, minorities, outsiders, if that's what you want to call me as a foreigner, uh, have just as much of it as, as anybody else. Um, and I particularly like being in a creative environment with, in a museum with you, a, an artist who I think you weren't trained as an artist, but um, it, it resonates with me because creativity is not uh, you know, just reserved for what we usually think is, as creative fields. Mm -hmm. um, there are plenty of ways to express, express yourself or your ideas, your thoughts, your, um, you know, the thinking outside the box. That's, that's very, very important in, in finance. And that's not something that is particularly, you know, put forward when uh, people talk about hedge fund managers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you described yourself as an outsider. What benefits do you think that you were able to bring to the table as an outsider? Um, well, I would, I would think of two ways to think about it. A, from the um, objective point of view, I think there's been plenty of studies that are um, almost indisputable that diverse groups make better decisions, right? And that's been done in the academic field. It's been done for boards of corporations. It's also been done in, to a lesser extent, but in, in investment management. So that's sort of, what do I bring? I bring diversity. I bring a plurality of view. I bring a fresh perspective. And that is, in essence, if you want to be very crude about it, that brings money. Mm -hmm. That brings performance. Mm -hmm. Um, another way to think about it, and um, you know, that is a much more subjective or personal view, is feeling like an outsider um, sometimes gives you a license to say things or to disagree or to be awkward or be uncomfortable. Um, of course, it's always a fine line, right? If you're not, uh, if you can't melt, it's more difficult to express yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you sort of put it out there that you're not going to be like everybody else, then whatever you say is sort of, you have the excuse of not being like everybody mm -hmm. else. And in a way, it gives you cover. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you ever feel that way, where you feel like, I might as well say what I think, because regardless, I'm not going to fit in. Yeah. So, so there's a bit of, there's a bit of an advantage Absolutely. Uh, feeling sort of outside the, the mold. Yeah, when you get to assess the types of consequences and you know, hey, whether I show up and say what I feel or if I don't, I know what both consequences are. Why not lead with transparency? That's, that's, kind, of the, that's kind of the point. I, I mean, as you say it, of course, there are consequences and sometimes uh, you, you can accept them and sometimes you can't. I was in a fortunate position where I thought, What's the worst that can happen to me if I express myself? They're gonna, you know, disagree. It's gonna be awkward. They might yell at me. They might make fun of me. 
they're probably not going to fire me. They might fire me, but so be it. Uh, that's a, uh, I, I realize it's a, a, an envious position to be in where mm -hmm. you can, um, you know, take that risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You inevitably faced a lot of sexism in the workplace. What did you learn about yourself when you were facing sexism? Uh, I learned that there's a time to take things with humor and there's a time where um, you feel angry and you want to blow up. It might just be the right thing. <laughs> and it's, um, you know, young women sometimes ask me, what, how do I respond to a sexist comment, uh, to a macho behavior? It's very hard to calm down and, and act like nothing happened. Mm. And, um, you know, you tell me actually what you think, but sometimes to me, yeah, if intention and intensity matters, meaning if, if the intention is not mean, if the, if the comment is, um, you know, just a slip of the tongue, if the person is of an older generation, mm. if there's not a repeat behavior, then I think I could make light of it, make fun of it, and move on. Um, if it is a repeat offender, if the intention is bad, if, if the intensity of the behavior is bad enough, then I think the only response is to really get into, I mean, get angry. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure it's the right answer. It's mine. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. The, but sometimes I feel like there, I, there shouldn't be censoring. There should be a, a response that's um, very frontal. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think what it is is accountability. When, when you described how you would respond in some scenarios, um, I, I did not sense that uh, you, you were preachy or, or combative for the sake of being combative, but instead making sure that there was accountability. Right. Yeah, I, I think there's a difference. Yeah, yeah. When you talk about uh, these different types of sexism, in, in your book you talked about passive sexism and active sexism. What are the differences? Well, I actually came up with that, so it, it might be completely ludicrous for the, to most people. Um, what I was trying to say is that in finance, there's sort of this um, ambience that is pretty macho, and it probably in many uh, very heavily male-dominated uh, businesses. Um, so there are little comments, hey guys, or, you know, uh, uh, checking you out, or seeing, or making comments uh, uh, on what you're wearing, just little, little things here and there. And that's sort of to be expected, and I think every woman has gone through this, um, you know, certainly when the industry you were in, I'm sure there was a lot of that. And that's one thing that you can sort of go through this, you know, passively um, uh, annoying type of smell in the air. Mm. Uh, An example but, you mentioned was when someone greets everyone in the room with good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, right? gentlemen. A guy, well, guys is sort of very well accepted, but, uh, you know, when uh, people make fun about women's shoes and women's purses. That is a recurring joke that I've gotten I don't know how many times about our heels too high and our purses that are messy. Okay, it's not really funny, but it doesn't, it's not that harmful either. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, unfortunately, you know, quite present in those, in those businesses. Um, but then there's really what I call active sexism, which is, um, you know, harassment, which then um, that you can't joke about, you can't take lightly. And really, I was lucky not to face it. Mm. I think if you face that, it's very hard to come back from that. I mean, the options are very limited, right? You leave or you fight. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, when I think of um, the women I know who are very senior in finance, a lot of it was luck, which is the luck I had to have partners who were, you know, um, 
uh, supportive of me and a, a, a company where there might have been some passive sexism but no actively pushing me down or keeping me from being promoted mm. or, or, or you know, uh, doing my job properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, both types of sexism are not limited to finance. That's in the entire world. And unfortunately, so often we, we ask women about how they face sexism, how to combat it, or we try to equip women with these tools to face it. But I'd actually like to flip the script, and I'm curious about what you think men can do to combat that type of prejudice and to stop it. It's, it's a tough one because, um, well, there are, there are things you can do if you're in a position of power or seniority. You can promote women, you can mentor women, you can make sure you have women in your team and you're listening. And these are all, you know, important um, uh, behaviors uh, for the managers, but also to, you know, to inspire other men in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in the company or the community where they're, they're at. But I was thinking of instances where I faced direct sexism, particularly one instance when I was actually already the, the, the manager of my team presenting to a company, and the company CEO said, I made a comment, we disagreed, and he said, mm -mm, you're a woman, I'm a man, that's the end of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And I was just uh, taken aback, I tried to sort of argue my way back in, and he repeated like very firmly, no, no, we're not discussing, because you're a woman and I'm a man. And my team, uh, who were entirely composed of men, didn't say anything, they were dead silent. And I saw that the best uh, way to move forward was to change subject and, and move on. I was not going to move that fight. And later on, I thought, well, what did I want uh, those men to do? And it's not that easy because if they came to my rescue and said something, it would have looked like I needed them to help me out. And mm -hmm. that's not necessarily what I wanted. Actually, mm -hmm. that wasn't what I wanted. Um, so I didn't want them to say something, but staying silent was not great either. So one of them, um, came to me afterwards and acknowledged the situation and said, well, that was really bad behavior. That was awkward, that was stupid. And that simple fact, I thought, was really helpful. Okay. Just the acknowledgement that there was um, an elephant in the room, that, that something happened that was very uncomfortable. So at the very least, if you are in a situation where there is sexism, racism, um, and it's not clear if you have to protect and help, at the very least you should acknowledge yeah. and, and come forward and say, I saw what yeah. happened. Should I do something? Can I do something? Maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no. But there was only one who came to me and mm. said, hey, that was really... That, that was not right. Yeah, yeah. At the very least, it seems like in situations like that, uh, that type of attempted allyship can at least combat gaslighting. Right. So that you don't think that you imagined something. Because it, it can be so easy to get into the machinations of your mind and think that you're the one that's crazy. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was enough in that situation? How did it make you feel when when your colleague did that? I felt better. Um, I was mad as hell. We were supposed to have dinner together, and I said, I'm not, I'm not going to dinner. Mm. And he sort of walked me off the, <laughs> off the ledge and said, well, you know, go to dinner. This is a client. We need to raise that money. Let's, let's do this. Mm. Um, so we did. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, I don't know that indeed. it's a great tale with a you know fantastic morale at, at the end but uh, you know that was my way yeah yeah so so from experiences like that in your career and your very successful tenure what advice do you have for other women creatives as they're navigating their careers be it in the arts be it on wall street what advice do you have i don't know if it's an advice more than um a 
comment or an observation, and this is something we talked about, which is that, that a career is not linear, mm -hmm. right? That uh, oftentimes you think, I had this great goal in mind, or this, you had this great goal in mind, and there, there are twists and turns, and it's, you know, the ride itself is the great fun, um, but I don't, uh, it, it's really easy reading about other people through books, through media stories, through blogs, it's all super curated, and you have this vision of people who are successful who really tell the story in a very orderly, very purposeful way with a beginning, a middle, and the end, and it all points to a straight line where you know, they've managed to do everything they set out to do. My experience is very different. I fell into finance you know, uh, uh, by coincidence. I was not interested in finance until late in life. Um, I worked for a big company first, and I didn't really like that. I interviewed with this little hedge fund. It was tiny at the time. I thought, hey, that, that'll be fun. Those guys seem kind of interesting. I had no inkling that the business would take off, that the industry itself would take off. Um, so that's what happened, but there's no, it's hard to say that there was a master plan that yeah. I followed, so hopefully, young women and not so young can you know think about all right there are you know i'm doing this now and maybe i'll do something else mm -hmm. later that's kind of my my observation the other one is that luck is very important mm -hmm. i mean it's sad to say but you 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 do need luck and lots of people who are successful um you know again would want you to think that there was um, incredible skills, and there probably are incredible will, and there probably is, but there's just being at the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, when, when we free ourselves from th this fallacy that, that careers are linear in nature, when we free ourselves from that way of thinking, what do you think is unlocked? Possibilities to, for changes. And granted, I haven't changed much. I was in the same business for 20 years, right? <laughs> but, but there comes, a t but I could have been there for 10 more, more years without a lot of fun um, hmm. because it became very routine. The business changed from very entrepreneurial to sort of a big institution, pretty political um, with a lot of inertia. So, so to me, the, the joy of it was gone. And if you think, okay, it's not linear, something will happen, change is good every 20 years, uh, then you find yourself saying, well, all right, well then that chapter is over. Mm -hmm. let's, let's do something else. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's great fun. And I mean, this is what you did, right? Yeah. You close a chapter and open an hour, another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that a, a, a part of why I felt so seen in your writing is because uh, it reminded me of the questions, some of the uncertainty that I faced when I was facing pivots in my career. And it's nice to see that in the written word where you realize you're not in isolation. That is one thing that is certain as I meet more people now um, that I've written the book. I, you know, I'm on panels and speeches and and various university classes, um, but everything that we that I hear, uh, it's not new, and it's certainly not an isolation mm -hmm. from uh, the imposter syndrome that many women ask me about, to you know changes and pivoting in your life. We've all had it at uh, various ages, mm -hmm. you know those. Uh, I was talking to a bunch of USC students, so they're in their 20s, and they were talking about impo imposter syndromes, which is... I is everyone aware of imposter syndrome? Do you know this term? Let let's describe it. The feeling that you're not qualified or competent, and that you're hiding that fact. So going home feeling 
God, the, my colleagues don't know, but I actually don't know what I'm talking about. Mm. And it, it's particularly acute in women. Mm -hmm. At least it's been described by um, uh, researchers as, and it was, the, it was coined for a women's uh, feeling. We, I think all women have it. I certainly have yes. it uh, today, every it day. <laughs> so it, Imposter syndrome for me was um, in some of my engineering courses at Stanford where sometimes I wondered, I, well, I, I stuck out like a sore thumb. I still stick out, obviously. But sometimes I would wonder, it's amazing how much you can try to add uh, logic that is not rational. So I would think, maybe Stanford made a mistake. Or maybe there's another Autumn Brion that they thought was in the Aero Astro program. You spend so much time and it can feel so wasteful when, when you try to apply logic to right. imposter syndrome, which is not logical. No. And I think once you read it, and once you realize others have it, it's not like it goes away, it doesn't. But at least you can recognize it and sort of put it away as, ah, that's something I do. Mm. Maybe tomorrow I'll feel different. So is that how you deal with imposter syndrome now? Yeah, yeah. I still feel like a you know, failure or an imposter lots of times and I, and I think, oh yeah, that's, that's what I do. But really, if I think statistically, I'm probably as smart as the next guy, maybe smarter than, than lots of other guys. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's like how I go about in life, yeah. from one extreme to the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's bringing you joy now? Oh, lots of things. Um, Writing courses, uh, being a, in a beautiful museum, looking mm -hmm. at uh, paintings, talking to people who, um, you know, have fun questions and, and engaging conversations, um, taking a walk outside, mm -hmm. having an hour-long breakfast with my husband. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, those are great things. Yeah, <laughs> that definitely bring joy. So. So based on what you have seen um, on Wall Street and what you're witnessing now, and, and, and you've talked about how you're hopeful about changes in the field, you've described some of the benefits of a plurality of opinions and the benefits of diversity. Are you hopeful that diversity is improving in the field now? I am. Um, not because I think that Wall Street has awakened to the great values of equity and justice and fairness, but uh, because of very critical uh, pressure points. One is that investors are requiring mm -hmm. diversity and they're requiring it because they're seeing in studies that it brings more money. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that that's important for diversity. There have to be incentives. I think, look, the best, um, the most convincing reasons to bring diversity on a, and diversity is gender, but not only, it's minorities, it's, um, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of, of, uh, of people. Uh, but the most convincing arguments are generally not, at least not in finance, <laughs> that it's fair or moral. Mm -hmm. The more convincing arguments uh, is that it's going to improve performance and ultimately it's profitable. Um, I don't have anything against it, uh, but that's usually how I bring the debate on, now I sit on the board of companies, and if I argue for a diverse board, I go, I don't go, look, uh, it, it would be the right thing to do. No, I go, look, we'll make better decisions. Your company is diverse. Don't you want to mod motivate your employees or don't you want, uh, or conversely, you don't want to disenfranchise mm. uh, your people by having an all white or all ma male board. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all, I think, important um, pushing movements uh, that are starting to make a difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and really it's making a difference, like we're really in a pivoting moment. I was just talking to a journalist on Bloomberg who said, she is writing an article about hedge funds uh, launched by women, hmm. and it is really the first time that we have several ones launched by, launched by women and uh, launched at the billion dollar in assets under management. Wow. So that's a large size. Yeah. Um, 
because the, the problems we have in hedge funds or in investing in general is that not only are there um, very few women, but also they have fewer assets. And on a equal performance basis, women will attract less assets, meaning not only do we have to outperform to stay in business, but even when we outperform, we get less assets to manage. Right. So that is starting to change now, I think. What changes do you think that we'll see as a result of this increased diversity? I think we're going to look, I think the hedge fund business has been um, maturing and it's not been changing very much in the last few years, meaning um, at the end of my career, I was pretty much doing the same job the same way as I did 20 years ago, which is weird because everything's changed around us, the market, the information, the regulations and stuff. Um, and my hope is that if different people get into the business, then it's going to get more creative, more different structures are going to come up, maybe different types of fees, maybe different ways of investing, different uh, asset classes are going to mix, different structures. I, the sky is the limit, but I would imagine that it'll bring a, sort of a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> Does anyone have questions? Hmm. Um, I think I most admire people who listen and who are curious, mm. um, which again is, is maybe not the, the typical, typical image of somebody on Wall Street. Uh, but I do think it's important to um, be curious about people, what people say, uh, be it your analysts if you're running a portfolio or the CEO of a company if you're trying to understand their business um, or a lawyer if he has a particular strategy. I like that um, curiosity and the ability to you know, make room for, for different voices. Mm -hmm. That said, um, being a manager, is, it, it was tough. I mean, I didn't go into a hedge fund for no reason. My people skills are not particularly good. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I entered the business to shuffle money around, and that's what I thought I would do for most of my career. We grew so much that I, that I ended up having a team of people to manage, but it's, it's incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. It really is very difficult. Uh, and conversely, the hardest part of my job, I felt, was not really to find the trading idea, the, the investment, you know, thought, but uh, rather to sell it, to rally people around uh, your ideas, uh, which that is not particular to, to the job of finance, right? Correct. In, in any job, you've got to sell your ideas. And right. that's, that's really um, a selling skill, and it comes down to, to you know, connecting with people, that's, mm -hmm. that's tough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you bring listening and curiosity to your team as a manager? That's how I hired them. So somebody who could tell me a story, be it about an investment or his or her career, unfortunately we never had her, um, mm -hmm. but who would really be interesting and uh, would spark my curiosity to ask more, more questions. Um, and I always felt like we're on the same team. If they have good investment um, ideas, then they'll make money, I'll make money. This is great. We're not here to compete, at least not in my, in my team. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, trying to advocate for them, trying to, you know, uh, protect them from the wrath of the senior partners if, uh, if that happened and, you know, just nurture them to, uh, to take over a portfolio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you talked about how uh, some of your colleagues and the folks that were on your team, you still have relationships with. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Some have, mo have moved on, some are still with my uh, former employer, but yeah, no, we're very much in touch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. 
Other questions? Uh, when I left, I thought that the business had changed a lot and it wasn't clear to me that the structure um, was, was the best mousetrap. Um, what I mean by that is hedge funds are a specific types of investment management firm that charge a lot of fees. They charge a fee on assets and they charge a fee on their return. And it used to be they were able to charge that much money because they outperformed the market consistently. I don't mean that one hedge fund one year outperformed. I meant that as an asset class, hedge fund outperformed the market for a solid, you know, eight years from 2000 to 2008. After that, they didn't, they stopped. And I, there, I go in the book, um, into details about what I think uh, the reasons are. Um, but I felt um, that I was selling a product that was not priced well. So in other words, I was, we were charging too much relative to the performance. Um, and unless I had a better idea about how to fit the product uh, in terms of what I could deliver versus what I was charging, um, I didn't really have an interest in, in setting up my own firm. I did think, and we sort of explored that uh, possibility uh, for a little while with my former, with Canyon Capital where I worked, I did think, well, it would be nice um, if I raised money as a woman-owned business. There should be investors interested in that. For a variety of reasons, it, it didn't work out. And then, um, I had a taste of life without working, and now <laughs> that's, that's that. Why don't I start a firm now? Because I haven't worked for three years, and it's, it's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> but the main reason is I was, I was a little bored with the job, doing it the same way I did it for 20 years. And I, I was really having cognitive dissonance about selling a product that I had less I didn't really believe in anymore. Mm. There are some market inefficiencies. Uh, the main problem with hedge funds is that it's now a very mature industry. So if you look at the first 10 years of the, of the business, particularly when I started in, uh, in 98, there were about 3,000 funds managing 500 billion in assets. There are 20,000 today mm. managing 4 trillion in assets. And so the idea that hedge funds can beat the market is sort of almost an oxymoron because they are the market, right. they are so large. Um, the inefficiencies that you talk about are usually best exploited by small funds because they're nimble. And because by definition, once there's an inefficiency, it's being exploited, others will come and mimic and then pretty soon that arbitrage is gone. So again, it really favors small funds. Small funds are hard to raise, hard to, um, the investors by and large tend to go towards very large um, hedge fund these days. Why? Not because they have better returns, but because they have a brand. Mm -hmm. It's the safest bet. Like any mature industry, at some point, the offering is not very differentiated. You know, there are, you have tons of soft drinks and they kind of taste the same, <laughs> but you're gonna go with Coke because you like that brand. Mm -hmm. And unsurprisingly for an industry like the hedge fund business that's gone through, you know, an S-curve and is very mature and competitive and crowded, um, investors like a good brand. So they go to KKR and Apollo and Oak Tree that manage hundreds of billions of in assets. And for those, it's very hard to exploit, um, you know, inefficiencies and arbitrage uh, still out there in the market. So their returns are kind of average. Mm. So I, I want to be clear that I, I don't 
have an advice. I can give you my perspective. Autumn, maybe you can, well, I don't think you have a child because you're very No young. little ones, just some plants, but. <laughs> but you can, I can give you my opinion, but you know, at the end of the day, I just wrote a book about my experience. <laughs> that doesn't make me an expert mm. on, you know, uh, female careers or, uh, or job man management. So take that with a grain of salt. But um, look, when I was pregnant, I, um, I took my 10 week of leave. And by the time I came back, my analyst had um, departed my group. I had a a team of one and he basically asked to be transferred and work for somebody else so when I came back very mm. much to, <laughs> towards your point mm. I was back to not having my my analyst um, and uh, I remember saying uh, to 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 the guy hey uh, I'm taking a maternity leave so I, I'll be I'll be out he's like oh yeah what are you gonna do on your vacation and I thought, I'm sorry, my what? No, I'm actually, you know, going to have another physical human being coming out of me. But, you know, if you want to call it a vacation, yeah, I'll probably party and, like, you know, drink heavily. This is what the analysts ask you. Yes, what are you going to do on your vacation? And I said, it's not really a vacation. I mean, what do you think? I'm going to party up and drink? No, I'm actually going to have a baby. That's what I plan to do. Right. Um, so there was um, there was a little bit of starting again and um, you know finding your spot again in the team and proving again that you're going to be there and it's sort of um, you're in a tough spot because it's if you're not a stay at home mother you get comments and I did uh, get some really annoying comments my. Um, husband would help me get over them because I took them very personally in the beginning but um, men who would say oh you're you're still working um, who's raising your kids oh your your nanny's raising a kid I would never let a, a, a stranger raise my child and it, you know it it was uh, mm -hmm. you really have to think about the response that no she I do have a nanny, she's not raising my kid, she is helping me as, you know, a, a, another set of hands, but I'm still the mother raising the kid. Mm -hmm. So um, you got to be resilient to that type of, uh, mm. of comment because they're, they're coming. Mm. And uh, yeah, it might, be, it might be a step back. Other than, you know, sticking with it and persisting and being resilient, I'm not quite sure what other advice to to give honestly I yeah I uh, unfortunately um, what, what gives me pause with that line of questioning which which isn't uncommon is that I'm sure your male colleagues were never posed with that question about who was no. raising their kids while they were at work no of course not yeah of course not and you know this is one uh, the other classic is I go to a, a finance conference because I'm asked to give a talk about investing in, you know, whatever it is, um, with other men on, the, on, on a panel. And at the end, somebody asked me, how do I balance mm -hmm. professional life and personal life? Yeah. Which I think, the work -life how is balance that question. related to collateralized loan obligations? <laughs> <laughs> Did I say something? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, a, it's a, I think um, I'm hopeful that as more women get to senior positions, that line of thinking will change, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a tough question because in 20 years I've met only one other part, female partner. So it's hard to draw any conclusion mm -hmm. from that. Um, but what I would say is um, I really do believe that everyone has their own style, um, probably in consulting, definitely in investing. So there are, um, there were colleagues and and uh, and guys that I know whose style was to be on the phone, super aggressive, ask what other people 
people's positions where um, talk to the traders and that was their style. There were others who were very studious and uh, their day was spent reading financials and reading um, uh, bond indentures and court documents. That was their style. Some were sort of a, a bit in the middle. Some liked to get on the road and go to conferences and that's where they would get their ideas and increase that, their network and meet companies and management teams. That was their style. And I think you will find yours, mm. right? It doesn't have to be anybody else's. It, you, you really uh, do not have to adhere to a particular image of what a consultant should be, I think. Um, certainly, it was my observa observation that I didn't need to be like any of the other guys to do well. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned that you didn't have a mentor, right? No. How did you develop your style? Through doing, I think the notion, the concept of, of a mentor is pretty recent. Uh, I don't think that really existed 15, 20 years ago. Certainly not in finance. I mean, that was, that was not a thing. Um, my partners were, um, great in that they wanted me to make money. But to me, a mentor is somebody who takes interest in, in you as, uh, in your personal development beyond the, the, the profit of the firm, really for your own well-being. So I didn't have that. I had great, um, great co-partners who had done this job and were very successful and smart and I could look, look up to them for their um, investment acumen. They wanted me to do well because they wanted their firm to do well. Mm. That's perfectly respectable. But they didn't take a particular interest in, in me. Um, so I you know, found myself by doing, like very much like uh, an artist is like painting a no. canvas or putting together pieces. You realize there are things that work and things that don't work. That's not my side, I can't do that. This works, that's my trick, that's how I enter the room, that's how I lead a conversation, that's how I get somebody to listen. Um, that's sort of the, the craft of the job, mm -hmm. uh, like I'm assuming any job, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, um, in my mind, it's the same, it's the same issue, right? Um, women are not a, a minority. I happen to be a white female, so that's sort of my message and that was my experience. But certainly my thinking around diversity in the investment team of a hedge fund uh, does not only, uh, does not apply to gender only. It, it happens to, uh, it, it applies to minorities in general and people who are different. Peop the worst enemy of, of, of a hedge fund, an investment firm, is groupthink, mm. right? And if I think of um, performance for this investment firm, just like I would think um, of a sports team, if you want a performing sports team, you don't get, you know, 10 goalies for a soccer <laughs> team. You know, that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so that is my sort of uh, uh, conviction for, for an investment team at a hedge fund, for a board, um, uh, for a corporate board. So it's, it's the same, you know, it's the same fight. Um, so I write about genders, but I write, I always, you know, make the point about minorities and outsiders, however you want to call them. Um, so I, you know, the book is my way of doing it. Talking to people is my way of doing it. And in the uh, professional life that I have left, which is being a, a board member, I try as best as I can to move boards towards, uh, you know, increasing the size or replacing board members with either women or minorities. It's a um, it's a long term goal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen overnight, but that's that's what I'm trying to do. It's hard also to be um, 
the only one of, right? Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen, you're, you're talking about your classes at Stanford, but um, where, where if you're the only woman, the only African American, the only uh, transgender, it's sort of like, not only do you have to perform because you're kind of representing, and if you don't perform, there goes the woman. Of course, she's messing up because she's mm. the woman or the whatever. So there's not only that, but there's also a, 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 a lot of times the weight and the pressure to also lead the fight for more of you. Yeah. And it's, it, it really is tough when you tell the only woman of a, a, in a company, hey, you'd better, the, the understanding is you'd better do well, otherwise it's pretty clear that they're not gonna hire another woman. And on top of that, because you're a woman, you should lead the diversity effort and try to find. And I, Unpaid I, labor. I, I hear that is happening in a lot of companies no. where the, you know, the only Asian, Indian, African American not only is sort of very isolated and, and the spotlight is on him or her, but also why don't you lead the diversity effort to, to bring more people? It's sort of, how much do you put on one person? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough gig. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that you brought up the term intersectionality, which was actually coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. She's a professor at UCLA, and uh, uh, these are the types of terms where imposter syndrome or intersectionality, innately we have understood what those mean, but we give thanks to the scholars and the writers that, that create a name for it, the vocabulary for it, so that we can converse and, and have a shared lexicon. But her idea was that uh, the experience of black womanhood was not just blackness and was not just womanhood and that, that movements like the civil rights movement were, were patriarchal, and movements like first wave feminism were white supremacist. And she created a term to, to describe what it means to be in more than one place at once. And I think that when we call out terms like intersectionality and when we invite more folks to movements towards equity, I, I think that we get there more quickly. We can go further faster. And I think that's what the benefit is. Several things. The first is if I inspire one USC student to say, oh, yeah, that, that looks like a cool job. I should do that. That is great. That's one goal that I can check. Um, the other is to show what it was like. It was cathartic. But, but with humor. So if there's one hedge fund written by a woman about a woman that's funny out there, that is sort of, you know, if, if somebody asks, hey, do you know any, any book about finance or investing? And I, I, I may be interested, I may not be, I may work in the field, I may not, but I have three hours and I want a light reading. What is it? <laughs> then at least there's one thing that's not Ray Dalio, the man who beat the market, <laughs> or, you know, Bill Ackman, the man who, you know, whatever, took Herbalife down, or the, whatever it is, uh, but something a little bit lighter yeah. than that's, but yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a labor of love um, with, uh, it's a grind to promote it, there's no money in it, but if the message um, is helpful to even a few young professionals, women, minorities, transgender, gay, lesbian, who think, hey, I could work on Wall Street. That woman's kind of whatever. She's not that special. I could do it too. Then, then I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Would you write another book? Would you do it again? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's your honesty. <laughs> It's interesting. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it was so successful for so long. I mean, it's been an incredible ride. Hedge fund managers have made so much money. Why would you change anything? It works. Mm. It's great. And 
look, the um, human tendency, I think, is to hire and promote people who look like you and think like you. So it's not an excuse, but it is an explanation, which is you don't change a team that's winning and the team is is mostly white male so that's what they do I think the difference now is uh, there there's really outside pressure to change it and the business is not working that well anymore mm -hmm. so there are those two factors where you know the performance is not that great and on top of that your lim limited partners are asking for diversity that sort of moves the, the needle. But you're right, for um, several years now, the hedge fund industry, while I contend that it's very mature now, it's still acting like this little entrepreneurial business that doesn't need to change. Mm. Typically, um, youngish businesses, uh, certainly finance in the beginning, high tech, VC, private equity, it's very male oriented in the beginning. Um, and then as they grow bigger, they become more institutionalized, they gain in diversity. So businesses in finance that have existed for hundreds of years, investment banks and corporate law, litigation law, they're much more diverse, partly because they have an HR department, they have a diversity, an equality uh, team. So it's all very institutionalized and it's all becoming part of the culture. But hedge funds still act like they're this little scrappy business that doesn't need to have any of those uh, structures. So I think it's it's just not, not moving or it hasn't until, until now. Mm. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Similarly to, to what you spoke about earlier, I would say my intellectual curiosity. Um, so I used to be an engineer, uh, specifically astrobiological research. Um, and then I was living and working um, on the African continent, um, building schools and townships. Um, and I started collecting art when I needed uh, an emotional respite. Uh, and then I, I just got to know the, the economy of art. But something that I've noticed whenever I pivot is um, when I come in as an outsider, so I, I, I don't have an MFA, I didn't study the arts. When I, I had never visited the continent before. I went to South Africa and then I ended up living there. But I become relentless. I've noticed with, with, start, with understanding how something works. And, and perhaps it's engineering, perhaps it's, I, I don't know where it comes from, but I, I have to take something apart and understand every single angle of it. If it's uh, how to install artwork or art history or, or whatever, I, I become obsessed with that. And, and I think that drive is what inspires my intellectual curiosity and what makes me give a second, third, fourth look. Um, so I get easily bored, so what attracts me is, is something new. And it, it's a weakness in the strength, but you know, when, it, when I've done something already, I, I sort of, it's tougher to get interested, but anything that's new, I'm always curious and I wanna, I, I wanna understand and think about it. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well said. But generally, our strengths are our weaknesses, too, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, you can say, oh, you're very persistent. And then, like, kids would say, she's so stubborn. <laughs> or, you know, or, or you have convictions. Oh, my God. She is just, she can't, she's not open. She's so stubborn. <laughs> no. Does your daughter play in the business? Or what I have two sons. No, they're not, uh, it's not looking like it. Oh, really? Hmm. No. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. For your questions. Yeah. <laughs>